and only 120 million Russians. <clears throat> so this is from the Economist Intelligence Unit. Uh, yes, so they have a research unit, um, which is sort of semi-independent from the magazine, but yeah, originates from the magazine. Uh, it's all available online, it's all publicly accessible, and they produce this every year. There are a whole ton of indis indices that um, weirdos like me like to look at, including obviously GDP and wealth, but have you ever looked at the happiness index? That's, that's a lot of fun too. Yeah, Norway, Scandinavian countries, so they always seem to come up top. So anyway, I just thought I'd bring this up because I brought it up a little bit at the start of uh, my last talk. Uh, and uh, it generally um, tends to interest and offend in equal measure. But Norway consistently at the top with the other Nordic countries pretty close. New Zealand pops in there most of the time. So you have Iceland, Sweden, Finland, Denmark. Our Swiss friends will be happy to be there. Germany not doing too badly. And of course, uh, United Kingdom in the top 20, not in the top 10. US, mm -mm, not so great. Where I live in France, somewhere down there. Um, anyway, oop, hopefully try and stand still while I do this. Right, so this is the index of um, democracies in the world. And they are categorized by four things, but I'll just show you the bottom of the list. So this is, as you won't be surprised to find, Afghanistan at the bottom of the list, uh, North Korea, Turkmenistan, DRC, Republic of Congo. Uh, and yeah, so this shows you the trending over the last eight, nine years. Um, so this is the bottom of the list, Belarus, uh, China at 148. So 167 countries in total. So this is the, these are the other ca uh, categories. Uh, authoritarian at the bottom. So you had dem full democracy, flawed democracy. I think the, f the third is hybrid democracy and authoritarian. Uh, and this is kind of more interesting. So this is the, not the annual trend, but the breakdown between the five criteria that the EIU, the Economist Intelligence Unit, uses to explain uh, how it comes to these conclusions. As I say, statistics are all lies. They're clearly based on their research, which you can pick lots of holes in. Um, but to get there, they use these five criteria, electoral process, pluralism, functioning of government, political participation, political culture, and civil liberties. And if you want to break them down further, you can look at the definitions as they're described online. But yeah, so these are the four categories. Full democracy, flawed democracy, hybrid regimes, and authoritarian regimes. And I bring it up partly because we, uh, we travel, I guess, to understand different parts of the world. <coughs> and inevitably, that brings us to how the people live. And I'm sure uh, we were all inevitably impressed by the way the Norwegians somehow seem to live in this quiet contentment with a very high standard of living, um, but consistently at the top of all of these indices. Norway doing something very quietly, uh, without great drama, somehow seem to have figured most things out. Um, but anyway, that's my opinion. You may have others. Uh, please chime in if you feel like it. But this is all available online if you ever want to look at it. I'll bring up some other boring indices maybe before my other talks, but I, I think it's kind of part of the background of why I travel anyway, probably why you do. Hi. Yes, if you just look up Democracy Index um, under Economist Intelligence Unit, if, if it brings up anything else, but Democracy Index, the EIU Democracy Index, 
You're welcome. Uh, so then very briefly, this is sort of tangentially linked to what I wanted to talk about, but this is the, uh, we've, we've had references to this so far, this is the Statens Pensionsfond Utland, the Norwegian uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund, which we've referenced in other talks. Um, but just to give you an idea, anyone know the population of Norway? So this is not per capita, this is total, okay, for five and a half million people, okay, this is in billion US dollars, the Sovereign Wealth Fund. This is not, this is not uh, proportional to the population. This is, this, is glo this is net, gross figures. In comparison to the China Investment Corporation Fund and going down the list, they are doing very nicely, very quietly in the background. And why? Because they've invested in all of these interesting uh, funds, and all of this is publicly owned wealth that is worth, I believe, $280,000 per Norwegian resident. So each of them has that in their kind of trust fund, which funds most of their social welfare programs for the next 300 years, I believe. Uh, and where does it come from? It comes from oil wealth, uh, and they are very smartly doing it before the end of North Sea Oil. This is a uh, news piece from 2017, uh, the dismantling of the Brent, the Brent crude uh, platform uh, C from the Brent field, which we are traveling through right now. So this was the dismantling of one of the earlier of the rigs. So you can see the... Uh, North Sea um, oil fields have peaked effectively uh, and many of them are being decommissioned. So this was quite an, uh, an impressive operation. And this particular rig, uh, just the top of it, but still I say the top of it, but you can see how massive they are, uh, was taken in its entirety uh, and is now being dismantled just south of where we'll go in a few days in Newcastle on the east coast of England. So we might sail past it, but it's being de decommissioned and dismantled. I think they're re recycling 98% of it. Um, but yep, yeah, so Norway has banked its oil wealth, if you like, very cleverly. And the British um, have started a sovereign wealth fund on Crowdfunder. And it's currently worth 20 pounds. <laughs> the British don't have a sovereign wealth fund. <laughs> Just to let you know. But some wise guy thought he'd start one. There we go. So, <laughs> the Norwegians are doing it a little bit better than the British, let's just say. Hi. Right, great question. What would they be doing if they hadn't discovered North Sea oil? The only comparison I can make would be uh, with the country I probably know better is Iceland, which doesn't have oil, um, which has a very healthy social welfare fund that seems to be doing very well as well. Uh, its oil, if you like, is its fisheries, uh, and it has uh, extracted the fisheries very successfully over many decades as Norway has extracted oil. Um, they would probably still be doing rather nicely, I suspect, because they're a pretty smart bunch of people, um, but nothing like that kind of wealth. Um, is it the luck of the draw? Somebody mentioned that the other day. Uh, yeah, it is, effectively, isn't it? I mean, it's the cards you're dealt. Right, which, which is... Ex Exactly. So, absolutely, I couldn't agree with you more. So the 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 point was, it's how it's what you do with it, and that was kind of my 
slightly facetious point about the United Kingdom's sovereign wealth fund, because British had much more oil deposits than the Norwegians. But we are also dealt the politicians we're given, and that's maybe the difference between these two countries that we are traveling between. So um, that brings me on to this, the story of the Vikings. Um, what's that got to do with oil wealth? Maybe there's a connection. Maybe they were smart enough to go out pillaging the world long before oil. But anyway, I thought I'd start our talk with someone else <laughs> who is probably just as contentious as the idea of uh, pillaging oil or extracting uh, natural resources, and that is our friend Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. But what does he have to do with our trip around Norway and across the North Sea? Um, well, obviously, he has a big oil story to tell as well, but that's not the story I'll be telling today. Um, he, Vlad, he's connected to what the Vikings were doing a thousand years ago. Uh, and the reason I make that link uh, is embedded in an essay that he wrote, which you get free drinks at the bar if you've read, <laughs> because you probably deserve it. It's called the Hist On the Historical Unity of Russians and Ukrainians. It's not that exciting, but there's a key passage in it in which he writes, or maybe it wasn't him, who knows, the spiritual choice made by St. Vladimir, who was both Prince of Novgorod and Grand Prince of Kiev, still largely determines our affinity today. And that's kind of the basis of what I'm going to talk about. It's a treatise on the history and the background of Russia and the emergence of the kingdom of the Rus. Um, so Putin's essay is now... Uh, a mandatory text for Russian soldiers. Um, you won't be surprised to hear that not all of it is historically accurate. But what he did get right, as you may or may not know, uh, is that many, if not most, of the people who call themselves Ukrainians or Russians or Belarusians are today largely the descendants of the Kievan Rus. Uh, they were once the largest of the tribal nations in Eastern Europe, and they included many different communities of uh, what we know today as Slavs. Um, and they were bound together across this large territory by pretty much one language, the language of the Slavs, the Slavic languages. Uh, they were ruled mostly uh, by the princes of Rurik, the Rurik dynasty, as well as being bound by the Orthodox faith. Um, and that was after the conversion of the Rus from pagan gods, as I mentioned in my last uh, talk, the conversion of Christianity across Europe, across Eastern Europe, and eventually across Scandinavia and to Iceland in the 10th century. And that is essentially what Putin is arguing in his essay. And his justification, for invading or taking back Ukraine, depending on your point of view, that the inhabitants of the lands of the Rus constituted the great kingdom of the Kievan Rus, and that they should all consider themselves Russians. So I'm clearly not going to get into that argument. But historically, he talks about the Slavics and the other tribes, but he conveniently also forgets to mention the influence of Scandinavians. And this is a map that I like, particularly because it's completely confusing. <laughs> not least because, well, it's not even written in English, it's written in, uh, in Norwegian. But uh, Borsetning is settlement. Uh, anyway, it, the point is, one of the reasons it's confusing is that it uses the concept of nation states, which didn't exist then, but Norway, Sweden, Denmark. And this gives you some idea of the influence of these regions and where they settled. And I'm not going to try and break it down in much detail, except to say that in my last talk, I spoke about how 
the Vikings or the Norse, and they weren't clearly Norwegians at that point, uh, moved across these waters that we're sailing over now really very easily. They, walked, they moved across uh, to Shetland, where we're heading, to obviously the British Isles, to Ireland, to Iceland, and further westward, as I mentioned, to Greenland, and eventually to what they call Vinland on the main coast and the Labrador coast, uh, where they settled very, very briefly. But uh, we need to not think of these areas as nation states, of course, and that's kind of part of this discussion. Uh, the bit that we don't really talk about is how they influenced the East. And that's obviously the point of my talk today. It is really kind of hard to believe that the Vikings in Eastern Europe are partly an unknown story, but they're also a very divided and disputed topic. So this is a, probably a better map. It's a lot easier to read anyway. Uh, but it gives you some idea of what happened in what is called more, more vaguely and more helpfully a Scandinavian settlement. Um, okay, more questions from me. Difference between Scandinavian and Nordic? Does anybody know? Yeah. Right. Thank you. That, that's absolutely. So Scandinavia, just to clear things up, is Norway, Sweden, Denmark. It's not normally considered to be Finland. It's not Iceland. And it's not the uh, North Sea Islands either. But the Nordic countries include those. Anyway, that to say, these are obviously not nation states. These are just the influences of these areas, these tribal kingdoms, west and east. But, as I say, it's a hotly disputed topic, and it was hotly disputed even within the Soviet era. There was strong pushback on the idea that Scandinavians might have settled the land of the Rus. Um, not just from Vladimir Putin, but from another of our favorite people, <clears throat> Joe Stalin. Because the official Soviet consensus was that the Scandinavians and the Vikings really only played a marginal role, a fairly forgettable role, and it was officially forgotten. That the Russians have no need to reference their Scandinavian influences. But this isn't a national argument uh, that was just the product of Putin or the Politburo. It goes back several uh, decades and centuries before. It was even considered to be uh, historically accurate in the 18th century under Peter the Great. Um, and particularly after Russia's defeat of Sweden in the Battle of Poltava. It was also reinforced uh, tragically and uh, lethally by what the Nazis did in invading the Soviet Union in Operation Barbarossa in 1941, which was obviously a massive and disastrous invasion of the Soviet Union. It was essentially a land grab. It was also an oil grab. Um, Hitler partly substantiated uh, Barbarossa by peddling a dangerous Nazi myth about Germans following a long tradition of Aryans uh, civilizing the barbarous Russians. So you can see just how offensive it is to the Soviets. Um, in other words, Nazi history represented Barbarossa um, in the same light, if you like, as the Vikings uh, civilizing uncivilized Slavic tribes from savagery. So, as I say, uh, the Soviets and the Russians clearly found that very offensive, and they still do, not least because of the 27 million dead in what the Soviets uh, and the Russians still call the Great Patriotic War, we refer to as World War II. So you can begin to see maybe, it's not an apology, but maybe where Putin's Russian origin story is based. Anyway, all that to say the impact 
of the Vikings on 9th and 10th century Europe has some reference to Arianism, um, but also it has been hugely distorted over the centuries. And distorted not least by uh, some of the uh, visual myths of the Vikings, um, uh, the idea of the long boats and these uh, brave uh, warriors, which they certainly were, but I don't know about you in the States, but British kids dress up in plastic horned helmets just to parade around as fun Vikings. Uh, they probably didn't wear horned helmets, by the way. Do kids wear this kind of stuff in the US or anywhere else? No? Halloween? Okay. Um, so it's fairly, uh, fairly common in British elementary schools to uh, kind of make believe in this fashion. Uh, this is from a kid's textbook, uh, just having fun with Viking ideas. And there are even uh, British uh, elementary school children who learn about uh, King Alfred, um, who burned the cakes. You ever heard that story? Okay, well, apparently he was so busy figuring out how to avoid the Vikings that he burned the lady's cakes when he was sheltering in her house. Anyway, these are the stories that kind of get told about a sort of comic, cuddly Viking history. The truth, of course, is very different. In my last lecture, I talked about those epic Viking expeditions westward uh, beyond the British Isles, and I mentioned to Iceland and Greenland and across to Anso's Meadow, which is down here, uh, where they settled for about 10 years, maybe more, but we just don't have any further archaeological evidence to prove that. Um, but as I say, their expeditions to the east and their influence over the Kievan Rus are maybe less well known by us. So this is the story of those Norsemen, occasionally women, uh, who navigated some terrifying rivers to go east and to get their hands on the riches of the capitals of the greatest empires on earth. They were the Byzantine Empire down south. And just try to imagine that this was a time when the riches were south. The riches were south and east in lands that today we call Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, the Middle East, what was Mesopotamia, essentially the origins of the Fertile Crescent um, and where the money was. So, how did they get their hands on that money? Let's look more closely at those Viking conquests again. Um, you'll see from Scandinavia, you can either build yourself a ship and go west, as I've said and spoken about, um, and you can head over this North Sea and keep going over the Arctic Ocean and the Atlantic. Or if you go east, and as I keep saying, this wasn't Sweden or Norway, these were land masses with tribal groups, uh, you could go east and you could cross the Baltic and beyond that to the Gulf of Finland, and you could eventually reach that vast expanse of land uh, of Eurasia. And the Vikings knew this in their mythology as a land of giants, of dwarves, of course, of trolls, and of men with mouths between their nipples, and who never spoke but just barked. So it was a frightening place to conceive of. So they clearly had some courage to head east as much as it was to need to go west. Perhaps is this is also where the myth of the barbarians developed, that myth of the treacherous barbaric Slavs. Clearly history is written by the winners and most victors paint their conquered peoples as barbaric. As I think I'll probably show, the Vikings had no uh, particular um, lack of barbarity in the way that they conducted their business. But either way, the lands of Eurasia must have been an intimidating place. Not least because the geology and the geography, as I'll explain, uh, but they were following the money. 
and there's always a lot of motivation in that. So they were heading for those rich lands of the caliphate and the stunning wealth of the Byzantine Empire. And let's just say you're a Viking and you're living on a frozen Norwegian fjord all those centuries ago, a thousand years ago. You'd be looking out west, as I say, to the North Sea, to the cultivated farmlands of England and Scotland, where we're going now, and to the monasteries of Ireland. But if you're a Viking in what we know today as Sweden, you'd be looking southeast towards the island of Gotland, and that's a whole other story. So Gotland is where uh, the Norse generally started uh, their travels east. They would have found crews of sailors, and that's where archaeologists have found these uh, dirham coins in Sweden in one of the digs. Hi. How did they know the land was further, further south and east? Right. Well, that's a great question. How did they know? How did they know anything at all? I mean, I touched on... I mean, it's almost an existential question about exploration. How did anybody ever start anywhere? Did Columbus know where he was going when he went west? He thought he was going to China and India. He obviously ended up in the Caribbean, as we know today. Uh, did the uh, Norse who landed on Iceland know they were going to Iceland? Um, I mentioned that some of them may have just drifted off course. They may have been trying to find lands further up the Norse coast and been blown out to sea by a storm. Some of them landed by accident on some islands. I, I mean, my theory is that most things happen by accident. I think the first, uh, the first people who discover most things are mostly lucky accident, sometimes unlucky accident. If you're, if you're a chemist or a biologist, you might agree with me. Some people uh, very uh, um, concentratedly follow a lead, maybe a happy coincidence led by information. Um, I, I don't have the answer. Somebody got there first. Somebody told a story. Somebody believed that story and brought other people with them, like uh, Eric the Red, who brought people back with him to Greenland um, and persuaded them to come back. But mostly, well, my instinct, my, my, <laughs> my life experience is that most things happen by accident. You may have a different take. Um, but at some point, they chose to continue uh, going down those rivers. A lot was passed down those rivers by oral tradition, so there would have been stories Somebody somewhere believed one or two of those stories. But eventually, those uh, explorers, adventurers, warriors, pillagers, looters, however you want to call them, continued uh, beyond Gotland. Uh, and they crossed the Baltic. And this is a slightly clearer map of this area of the Eurasian landmass. And they ended up up the Finland, uh, the Bay of Finland, into what we know today as Starayalot Ladoga, and uh, they then began their journey from there towards Miklagard, or what we know as Istanbul or Constantinople. So, as I say, they were heading towards the wealth of the caliphate. Along the way, they would keep themselves warm by trapping furs, um, they would also sell those furs and they would then venture further south and develop a much more profitable enterprise by selling slaves. That was where they were heading, but, belong, uh, but along those river journeys, they were essentially starting a massive slaving enterprise. And they were very smart about it, as I'll explain. So, you can see to some extent why Vladimir Putin and the Russians are not keen on the story that characterizes the Slavs, you probably guessed the etymology of the word, uh, as slaves of Scandinavian marauders. So as I say, their journey took them east up the Gulf of Finland into the Volkov River at Staraya Ladoga, 
This was one of the paintings that I found of the slave market. Those are the marauders. And this takes us back to that much clearer map um, as they start to head south and east. They brought with them, of course, their famous technology of uh, rowboats. In some cases, we call them longboats. Um, and that, to some extent, also explains the etymology of the word rus, which means to row. And it became the land of the rowers. In fact, the Finnish word for Sweden is ruotsi, which is the land of the rowers, derived from the same linguistic root. So these oar-driven ships negotiated very shallow waters in places up these treacherous rivers. And in some cases, they had to be carried or portaged over land. And that's where this very clever and uh, very profitable business model that they developed came in. Because the slaves that they captured um, were the slaves that then portaged the boats over the mountains in order to transport themselves to those slave markets. Initially, though, it wasn't a settler enterprise. It was very much a commercial, if you like, profitable venture. And the early Norse were effectively heading south to make a buck and head home. Uh, along the way, they built uh, wooden forts to store their equipment, to make repairs, to pick up information, and of course to do some deals, not least of which, of course, were uh, slavery deals. And they developed eventually into trading posts where they could wait if the rivers were unnavigable. But they also managed from here to develop small towns, and I'll talk about those in a moment. One of them became uh, Novgorod, beyond which they would then take their boats down the Dnieper uh, River uh, to the Black Sea, uh, which of course is the focus at the moment of our good friend Vladimir Putin. From there, they would eventually make their way towards the magnificent town of Miklagard. Um, today, of course, many Ukrainians and Russians uh, will be very familiar with that route, but then it would have been very, very treacherous and unknown territory. The Vikings would head, head either down the Volga to the Caspian Sea and from there to the equally glamorous and sophisticated wealth, as I said, of Baghdad and the lands of Central Asia. Please. Correct, yes. Did the countries they were traveling through already have a, a culture of slavery? Um, your questions are existential because I would simply say yes, in the sense that slavery was part of the deal, wasn't it? As far as everything I've ever read, Right. Absolutely. So the question is, were they introducing a, a, a barbaric, uh, immoral, well, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing what, what you said, but I think some of the implications sometimes of the idea that certain races brought slavery uh, to others uh, implies that there was, um, if you like, no moral compass. Clearly, there's not much moral compass in slavery in our, in our uh, uh, ethical view today, as there isn't either in cannibalism or any other practice. Right. So, so I would absolutely agree with you that slavery and trading in people, uh, as was um, bloodthirsty ventures of all sorts, including cannibalism, um, part of the backdrop of their experience. So, so if you like, you're touching on 
The very point that many Russians find offensive is the idea that Scandinavians brought slavery. Did they bring slavery? Did it exist? Were they simply profiting on an existing trade? I, I would tend to say the latter. Um, and so this brings up this very point of who were the barbarians uh, in a world where life was cheap. Um, it was a pretty barbaric world. Does that, that doesn't answer your point at all, except to affirm, I think, what you're, what you're suggesting, which is... Right. Right. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to uh, repeat back what you just said, except that some people hopefully might have picked up on it, uh, simply because I think it's, it's, it's a fascinating and much longer discussion. Um, but I would tend to simply affirm your point that they weren't introducing new ideas. Maybe they were just better at it, better, in inverted commas. Um, and I'll come on to that in a moment in terms of their abilities, their capabilities, their technology, which is reflected in their uh, rowboats, particularly, and in their navigational abilities. Maybe they were just tougher, meaner, and nastier than everyone else. Maybe not. So, just to come back to where we are, uh, I mentioned the Volga, <coughs> excuse me, and the Dnieper. Onwards from there, they would have found even greater risks because along their river journey, they meet ferocious rapids. And they were chronicled by the Byzantine Emperor Constantine the VII uh, in a 10th century guide that he wrote that uh, actually describes very helpfully for us many of these inland river routes. So uh, it wasn't just the, Sl the Scandinavians and the Slavs who would have known about these routes. Many of the Byzantines would have done too, of course, because the trade, as I'll mention later, was always in two directions, which is why it's useful also to bear that in mind when it comes to who settled Norway, who settled the British Isles. We were moving in all sorts of directions. I say we, humankind. So as they row, the Norse come across uh, other nomadic tribes, uh, such as the Pechenegs, um, and according to Viking legend, uh, they would supposedly cut your head off and fashion it into a goblet if they didn't like you. So who were the barbarians? Uh, whether true or fanciful, you can begin to see the emergence here of exactly this theme, this brutal, savage narrative that uh, Columbus as well, uh, used to his advantage uh, to fund his travels by telling the Spanish queen uh, about the savages that he had come across. Uh, later, European explorers would do the same. Uh, the British were no exception. Uh, many of their texts, uh, until frighteningly recently, would imply the same. So, it was very often the invaders who were the more savage, and the more brutal, and the more terrifying, but then they would come across other tribes who would match them at the same game. Everything, of course, depends on your point of view, inevitably on your politics, which is where Putin comes in. The Vikings encountered other indigenous tribes, uh, as well as the Pechenegs. They encountered the Khazars. Uh, they were a uh, nomadic people, that lived across this expanse of land between the Black Sea and the Caspian. Um, and they, interestingly, rather than converting to Christianity in the 10th or 11th century, uh, converted to Judaism and became the only recorded uh, state, if you can call it that, 
uh, between Roman times and the establishment of the state of Israel to call themselves the Jewish state, but state I use in inverted commas. Um, having negotiated or traded with the Khazars, the Vikings then continued their sailing uh, on towards the Caspian and the Black Seas over these treacherous rapids which occasionally they would have to get their slaves to portage their boats over. They called the rapids great names in their stories, including Esupi, the drinker, Gilandri, the yeller, L4, the fierce, and Lianti, the laugher. And those with Baghdad in their sights uh, were hoping to be paid, as I said, in silver in return for their slaves. So they portaged their boats all the way down those rivers. By now, you've probably already guessed or you already know, as I've mentioned already, that Slav derives from that same linguistic root as slave in English and many other European languages. So, uh, Michael McCormick, uh, in his book Origins of the European Economy, argues that the demand for slaves to the East was driven by the fact that the caliphate, the Abbasid Caliphate, uh, was essentially so economically and so technologically advanced at that point in comparison with Eastern and Western and Northern Europe, um, that there was really only one thing that interested them. Because we, <laughs> I say advisedly, Europeans, had nothing else to offer them. The only resource that could possibly interest them was slaves. So, as good early capitalists, the Norse spotted a market opportunity, let's say. They responded to the demand, they headed for those Arab slave markets, and they made a quick buck, they made a big buck, and as good entrepreneurs, they then reinvested in their businesses, essentially building bigger ships and funding their future expeditions, both south and westward. So where did the silver come from that interested the Vikings that they wanted to take home? At the end of the uh, ninth century, the Samanids um, from Central Asia had discovered vast silver mines. But like a lot of businesses, the Vikings were hit by cash flow problems. Uh, around 960 or so, many of those silver mines uh, dried up. And interestingly, it's at these points in history that we can derive a parallel with when they went westward and pestered the British. So you could say that the supply of silver from the Salmonid mines, or the lack of it, may have driven their expeditions westward and may have been the reason why King Alfred burned his cakes. There is a link in the chronology. And I, I kind of find this angle quite fascinating because we don't usually make this link between the emergence of an English nation, the emergence of English nationhood, and the uh, conditionality of the availability of salmonid silver down in the far regions of the caliphate. But as you can see, we clearly didn't invent globalization or the international supply chain. It's all been going on a lot longer than we think. By considering those eastern and those western Viking routes together, we start to understand the development of medieval Europe. But of course, as I said, this trade network operated both ways. It wasn't just the impact of the Norse on the road to Miklagard and Baghdad. There was movement in the opposite direction too, because otherwise they wouldn't have found those Arabic dirham silver coins. Recently, the grave of a Scandinavian woman uh, wearing a ring with an identification of Allah was excavated in Burka in Sweden, and uh, textiles with Quranic phrases have also been discovered in the Viking homelands. So, were they brought back by the Vikings? Did the Arabs make their way 
into Norse territory? Um, probably both, because of course they were also very capable uh, seafarers and navigators or river dwellers too. Um, but in uh, some of the Viking texts, notable Arabs are mentioned, including uh, al muqtadir who uh, sent um, his emissary, uh, Ahmad ibn Faden, as his envoy from the caliphate. And uh, bin Faden uh, was a missionary, essentially. He built a mosque uh, in the region of the Bulgars, um, and uh, he then found the Vikings uh, in this part of the world, uh, trading with, or enslaving perhaps, a semi-nomadic Turkic tribe in the region. Ibn Fadden's account provides us with one of the few detailed descriptions of the Vikings in the texts uh, in the land of the Rus. And uh, it's, again, the colonial story that modern Russians don't appreciate, but which is endlessly fascinating for many archaeologists. Um, he describes the Vikings that he met as... Uh, Wait, I've lost my slide. Well, I'll read it to you anyway. He describes the, uh, um, barbar the, <laughs> the Vikings that he met as barbarians, essentially. He, called, he describes them as tall as date palms, blonde, ruddy, strong, self-confident, but the filthiest of Allah's creatures, like wayward donkeys, barbarians, and savages who don't wash. So, again, who are the barbarians? One of the stories of the myths that the Russians find particularly offensive, as I say, claims that in the late 9th century, the tribes living in the Kievan Rus, the tribes that we uh, have described as the, the Shuds and the Slavs, and the Krivchians and the Ves, were fighting amongst themselves so frequently that they collectively turned to the Vikings to rule them. So, unlikely, but it's certainly been written into some of the Norse texts, uh, and it was uh, then the leader of the Vikings, Rurik, who was supposedly invited to come to manage these uh, unmanageable uh, tribal groups in the land of the Rus. So Rurik, from the Viking, uh, dynasty establishes himself in Novgorod in the second half of the ninth century, uh, and there is even a statue of him in Novgorod to today. We actually know very little about Rurik, uh, as we know very little about many of these characters, uh, because, of course, most of these oral histories were inevitably only written many hundreds of years later. <clears throat> In this case, his account is written 200 years later uh, by a monk called Nestor, writing at the Monastery of the Caves in Kiev, which is also a site that gets Mr. Putin very worked up. Uh, as with many early medieval histories, we just don't know how much of Nestor's account is fact or legend, much like those Icelandic sagas that I also mentioned. Very little literacy in those days. Most of the tradition was oral. Most of the stories were handed down by word of mouth. So much of it inevitably would have changed and been distorted over the centuries before it was written. What we do know is that a Viking dynasty established itself in Kiev and Novgorod, much as it did around the same time as in Jorvik, or York, which we will be going past on the east coast of England. The story goes that over time, Rurik's successors moved to Kiev, from where the modern countries of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus originate. Two of his descendants were Vikings, called Auskold and Dia, if, of course, they ever existed, because, as always, the story is complex. But by taking over Kiev, they were assured access 
to the strategic regions of the Black Sea that, as I say, is clearly very important to Mr. Putin today and beyond that to Miklagard. And it's at this point in what's known as the Macedonian Renaissance, this hugely wealthy development of the Byzantine Empire, that the riches of Constantinople were shimmering in that Viking imagination. In fact, some historians believe that descriptions of Asgard and Valhalla may have actually been drawn from elements of the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. So the story goes that Asgold and Dia turn up at the gates of Constantinople with their sh ships and they take its inhabitants by surprise. In reality, the walls of Constantinople were built to be impregnable and there was never much prospect that some Vikings in rowboats were going to capture the city outright. Instead, they attacked more vulnerable regions outside the city walls, including monasteries and churches, as they also later did in England. But the Byzantine Empire does something which the English and the Irish and the Frankish empires couldn't do or didn't choose to do because under siege by the Vikings, they chose to negotiate and they reached a compromise under which the Viking intruders could go on making a decent profit by supplying the Byzantines with slaves as well as narwhal tusks and amber and beeswax and many other things. In return, they would be honored as members of the Varangian Guard, the very uh, esteemed Byzantine Emperor's Guard, and so the Kievan Rus, or the Vikings, ancestors of what became Ukraine and Russia, were slowly absor absorbed into Byzantine culture. And they would go on to intermarry and gradually lose their pagan Scandinavian ancestry and roots and eventually become Christianized through the Orthodox Church, which brings us to possibly the most interesting of all of the rulers of Kiev, uh, someone called Olga, wife of Igor, who ruled Kiev as regent in the late 10th century. She also converted to Orthodox Christianity, but her son, Svatyaslav, known as Svatyaslav the Brave, the Rus ruler of Kiev retained his Slavic name. And this is kind of the point of my story because it reflects just that flux and moving sand of these different conquests that were shifting different heritages around human history. Which is why Putin's rigid argument, like many other ultranationalists, tends to hold up little water when held against the scrutiny of science. Anyway, eventually, poor old Svatislav was maybe too brave. He picked too many fights uh, with the Bulgars and the Khazars and the Pecheneks. And eventually, the Pecheneks, true to their word, decapitate him, plate his head, and turn it into gold to use as a drinking vessel. So again, who was tougher than who? It was a pretty barbaric world, as I said. And it's at this point that the last of the rulers in my story takes power. Vladimir Sviatoslavich, or Volodymyr Sviatoslavich. And it's then that we start to see the division, if you like, of the two nations that become Russia and Ukraine. It's pretty much this point that is considered to be the foundational moment for both nation states. And it's more or less where their histories begin to divide. You'll find statues of him in both countries. There's even one in London. And the whole origin story and the reason to some extent that Ukrainian history makes Putin's blood boil is because the whole issue of purity of origin is clearly an impossible, an impossible circle to square. Because as I hope to have explained, 
fixing these labels of nationality on people in the 9th and the 10th century is clearly nonsensical. So, to wrap up, whether the people we've been discussing were Norse, were Viking, were Rus, were Slavs, were Ukrainians, is to some extent largely irrelevant. What mattered at the time, to come to your point, uh, is, I would say, whichever tribal group had the better technology, the most power, the most money, the most guts or chutzpah, um, who had the most luck, maybe, but inevitably who could terrify their enemy the most. And perhaps that's the story of the war going on today. Today, of course, Vladimir and Volodymyr and Russia and Ukraine remain deeply divided, yet they are inextricably linked by these same stories. Of course, how much it is uh, important to you depends on your heritage, ultimately, of course, on your politics. But anyway, that for now is my story of Vlad and Vlad and the Vikings. Thank you. Thank you.